will occur around locking in the new gas. There's three trends I need to note in starting. The first one um, is that we know that the time for fossil fuel development is over. Um, you know, that's clear, that's borne out by all the climate science. I often refer back to the Institute um, or the IEA, the International Energy Agency, which is hardly a, you know, kind of left-wing, greeny kind of outfit. But a couple of months ago, they uh, released a report that said to have even a hope, a good hope of holding overall warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, we need to basically stop all new fossil fuel development from today, was their words. And we need to have no further, so no further oil, coal or gas. We need um, to transition our electricity sector uh, to net zero emissions by 2040 at the latest. And we can have no coal um, power stations operating that aren't abated. And for those of you that are interested in that side conversation around carbon capture and storage or, or low emission coal, which we know it just doesn't exist as a reality and it's not going to exist uh, in any foreseeable time frame. So as the IEA says, you know, the time for new fossil fuels is over. Um, the second really important observation to remember, and this is the part where, you know, we're really going with the flow, is the fact that we've passed a market and a technology tipping point. The energies of the future and the energy mix of the future, so renewable storage and energy efficiency is now cheaper than new build and pre-existing fossil fuels. The market has shifted, investment is flowing out of old energy sources and into the emerging technologies of the 21st century. So the market has already made up its mind um, and it's, it's meant that transition is now inevitable. The only question is, who's going to get in the way and who's going to facilitate it, which is where I'll get to in a minute. And then th the third thing uh, that's really important to understand our context is, I think that we're now witnessing the impacts of climate change. So in even in a couple of years ago, often when we would talk about climate change, it was considered something that will happen either somewhere else, perhaps in the Pacific to an atoll island nation or something, um, or in another time. And I think that the 2019-20 fires really changed the Australian attitude to climate change. And if you look around the world right now, you know, the heat dome in North America, the fires that are raging across the Northern Hemisphere from Alaska to Canada to the United States to Siberia. If you look at the, the recent flooding in China and Western Europe, if you look at the bushfires in Turkey, you know, clearly we have passed a tipping point and clearly people understand that. And if you think back to even a couple of years ago, I remember being here in central Victoria, we had some really very serious floods, perhaps three or four years ago. And to say this was linked to climate change was deemed to be almost like ambulance chasing. You couldn't draw that link at the time of a crisis. But if you look at mainstream reporting now, and I mean reasonable reporting as opposed to ideological reporting like the Murdoch press, you'll see that more and more the stories of the fires, the stories of the events that are happening right now are being couched and linked through to the connection to climate change. So those three things I think are really important. We've had the tipping point moment with the technologies. We've had uh, very clear evidence that the time for new fossil fuels is over and now more and more we get it. And I think that in many ways we hold our views in our mind, in our heads, but we hold our values in our heart. And I think that what's happening is that more and more people are understanding that climate change is real. And I think all of us in this room or in these rooms, we probably all had that point where you feel it in your bones. Um, I'm a, a CFA volunteer and I spend a lot of time on fire grounds. And I remember probably about four years ago being in a forest that I knew was being burnt for the third time in about 15 years. And I was looking at regrowth forest that was burning because the previous forest, you know, was dead. And this was forest that should only burn every 50 to 70 years. And it was burning on average every seven years. And I saw my first, what they call a pyro nimbo cumulus cloud. So those big fire plume clouds um, that um, where the convection currents are so strong, they can go 12,000 or 12 kilometers into the air. Um, and generate their own energy, which can in include their own weather, which can include lightning storms, which th can then set um, other 
forms um, of fires in front of them. I was just reading this week about a fire in Canada that had a, a fire plume cloud, a pyro cumulus cloud. It was creating fires 50 kilometres ahead of its front by virtue of the energy system that was going up into the atmosphere. It looks like a, almost like a nuclear mushroom and then lighting fires 50 kilometres in front. And that was my moment for me to see that first pyro cumulus cloud. And I just felt it in my bones. I felt like I was looking at some kind of Godzilla type monster. It was, it was enormous. That one went on to be 12 kilometres in height. And I just realised that, you know, this is the world we're living in now. We're living in the pyrocene, you know. And once you have that realisation in your heart, you never go back. Intellectually, we might know climate change is real, but when you feel it in your bones, it's different. And I feel that Australia has changed since those summers of 2019, 20. People get it now. So those three things align, um, but you have to make the observation that our federal government has profoundly failed us. So they're ultimately responsible for the energy policy in the country. They have comprehensively failed us. They've been supported in that failure by particularly the Murdoch press, but some other business press and the fossil fuel sector and the climate deniers in the coalition party. And they have been unwilling to shift um, on, the, on those three realities, the, the community perception that climate change is real, the fact that the technology is now geared towards the renewables rather than the fossil fuels and the science. But they haven't just failed to act. They've actually tried to do a handbrake turn and take us back in the wrong direction. And the cornerstone of their work in the last probably year and a half has been this concept of the gas-led recovery. Now, COVID has knocked around the economy, of course. And so we've got to you know, build back. And the argument goes, we've got to build back green. Unfortunately, um, our government has decided to build back brown. And they put the, the concept of the gas-led recovery at the corner of that. Whichever way you look at it, it has been a disaster. And um, if you want to drill into this a little bit, the Australia Institute did a really interesting report called Too Little Too Late. And it looked at what happened to the gas route recovery and they found that it basically disappeared without trace. Gas production is going up, but employment in that sector is going down. And even in spite of everything that we have with the lockdowns, um, other sectors like accommodation, food, retail, professional services, transport, health, manufacturing and education had all grown in employment during that year and a half that they looked at with the, the post-COVID recovery, whereas gas employment had gone down. So as, an, as a concept, it simply hasn't worked. It's been ideology overriding sensible economic policy. And the craziest idea that they put forward as part of their gas-led recovery is this notion of putting $600 million of our money into the Curry Curry gas plant in the Hunter Valley. Um, it will only create, it's expected 250 construction jobs and possibly only 10 operational jobs. It's going to operate at a financial loss. It will only be running for a couple of days in the year. Um, and the government is adamant they want to build this. They're putting also money into pipelines and they're doing everything they can to fast track onshore gas projects. So, you know, we're, we're in this really difficult space where we have this block. And I think that what's happening is governments are moving. So now all state and territory governments in the country have a net zero emissions target by 2050. We understand that that's too late, but it indicates, I think, the level of failure by the federal government on this issue. Um, I think the thing that we also need to understand um, is that the government is trying to have it both ways. They're trying to say, no, we understand climate. They've committed to certain emission reductions, although very admittedly very weak emission reductions to the, the Paris Agreement. So they're in the game, but they're out of the game and they're, they're at odds with the science and they're at odds with their own policy of reducing emissions. So on the ground, what that is leading to is a phenomenal number of gas projects. At one point, almost 50% of the land mass in the country was under exploration license or permit for various forms of fossil fuels. The hotspots that I'll quickly run through, and if you're interested in getting an overview on this, I'd really recommend Lock the Gate. Um, they have a fantastic page if you go onto their website where they give an overview um, of the, the hotspot areas around the country. But just to refresh your memories, you probably know there's the Lake Care Basin um, in the Channel Country in southwestern Queensland. There's the Narrabi Project uh, in western New South Wales. There's CSG or uh, 
uh, coal seam gas in the southwest of the state down on the Darling Downs. We've got some conventional gas and some tight gas undergoing expansion on the limestone coast, so the southern coast of South Australia. We've got a whole lot of tight gas and shale gas um, covering something like 100 million hectares, I think it is, of the Northern Territory. And a lot of that will involve fracking and a lot of that involves iconic landscapes like Kakadu. And then in Western Australia, we've got two massive regions um, up in the kind of the Kimberley area and down in the wheat belt in the south. Um, fantastic resource, if you're interested, is Frack Free WA. They have some very good resources on what's going on over there. And then here back home in Victoria, we've just had the onshore gas moratorium lifted. So stepping back, looking at the country, it's basically a free for all. We've got a federal government that is facilitating the development um, of these uh, projects by putting money in, by supporting it. And then we have state governments that are also facilitating this. And unfortunately, that's true in, here in Victoria. The Victorian government has done a good job of setting, of rebuilding the Climate Change Act, which was gutted when the Liberals were in power. They've committed to emission reduction targets of five years. The targets that they've set are, you know, um, are good, but not at the scale of what the climate science tells us. But at the same time, they're facilitating the development of onshore conventional gas. So that is really unfortunate. And I think what we need is consistency in policy, where if a government adopts climate policy, sensible climate policy, it has to be a consistent across the board. The, um, the, the moratorium was put in place because of community campaigning. And I'll mention it just in a couple of seconds because it is very relevant. And that is, if you think about the polling, if you think about community attitudes to climate change, most people are with us. The hardcore climate deniers are a tiny percentage of the population, generally less than, than 10%. But the commentators who speak to that demographic are like the squeaky wheel that gets all the noise. So the rest of us that aren't climate change deniers, we really aren't listened to by the dominant, the main two political parties and particularly the LNP. The beauty of the moratorium campaign in Victoria was it was one on the back of regional communities who were often national party and liberal voters, getting themselves organised and finding common ground. And the model they used was to build power and as they put it, was always to look up. So this was never a NIMBY proposition, not in my backyard, we don't want gas drilling here, it was we do not think that this is a viable future for our community. And whether they were into climate change or not, or whether they were worried about damage to aquifers or whether they were worried about trucks on their roads and what that meant for them taking their kids to school, or they were worried about property values, or they were worried about impacts on farming or on tourism, it didn't matter. As long as they were concerned about one of those issues, there was a, a sense of unity and a sense of place for everyone in that campaign. So it was non-ideological, but it built power um, that became basically unable to be... Um, you know, ignored by the main parties. And the model they used was communities would get together, they would door knock, they would ask their community, do you support us declaring ourselves gas fuel free? I think the smallest number they ever got was 86%, somewhere in Gippsland, but often it was well above 90. They would then declare themselves gas fuel free. It had no political power, but it had moral power. And I remember there was a point, and it was actually the declaration at Moriac, which is west of Geelong, where previously the politicians had ignored the declarations. And I remember at that one, pretty much every candidate and standing poly, both you know Victorian and federal, were elbowing each other out of the way to get in a photo op at the end. There was a point where it became the issue and then it became a dominant issue in the election that brought the Andrews government to power. That led to the ban on fracking, the first permanent ban, uh, ban in the country. It's now in our constitution. That is fantastic. And it also got the moratorium on the onshore gas drilling. So that is what has now lifted. Um, it stopped all onshore gas drilling since 2014 until uh, June this year. So it has contributed to reducing uh, climate change. Um, uh, however, now we are going to be facing a struggle of seeing gas and it's in two belts. If you can visualize in Gippsland from the Latrobe Valley down to the 90 mile beach, and then a long thin belt from the South Australian border down through all that kind of 
amazing sheep country down through MacArthur, down to Port Ferry, and then almost across, following the coast, almost across to the Otways. Really significant bit of country and some of our very best farmland, some of our country with the very best soil and the most well-watered parts of the state. So food bowls, it doesn't make sense, but that's the struggle we um, are going to be confronting. What I would do is invite you, if you were keen, was to come along to the launch of the Drill Watch campaign, which will be on August 11. If you just do a web search, Friends of the Earth Drill Watch, you'll find it. We're asking people to pledge their opposition to this campaign to join us in the launch. And it will be a, a, a website that empowers people to be able to identify what's going on with uh, onshore exploration. The final thing I will say, of course, is then we've got the offshore gas bonanza. And... Um, this is somewhere we're really going to be having to pay attention. Um, just a month or two ago, the federal government released something like 80,000 square kilometres of ocean in 24 parcels, 21 parcels, sorry, uh, to allow offshore oil and gas production. That's in the northwest offshore from the Kimberley. Um, it's south of kind of Cape Otway, Warrnambool down to King Island, and it's in Bass Strait. The good news is we have until March before bids are due. So we've got room and we've got time to build that campaign. But, you know, that is one where we really are going to have to be paying attention. And I guess to finish, the one other thing, the opportunity that I see at present that's very, very exciting when it comes to gas is a little while ago, a gas company went belly up and they couldn't afford to do the decommissioning on their rig. This was in the Timor Sea. Now, that led to an unprecedented moment where the federal government implemented a temporary decommissioning levy to pay for the cost of that decommissioning that was put, I think it was 48 cents in the barrel right across the board. The oil and gas industry had a seizure when this was put in place and it was a very good move by the coalition. There's a campaign opportunity to get them to turn that into a permanent levy we have, um, the figures are pretty amazing. We've got 2,000 offshore wells at present, roughly. We've got about 30 platforms. We've got about 3,500 kilometres of underwater pipelines that bring the gas on shore. Um, a lot of them are coming to their, the end of their life. And there is a very grave, very grave sorry, sorry, there is a very grave risk that, that these, these um, companies company walk away. away. And, and we, we as pay for pay the remediation. I'm, I'm getting it in my way. Yeah, I'm not sure why that's happening. I'm getting it too. Julian, have you got any ideas? I'm muting and I'm muting. Sorry? Sorry? Is that that? Still there? Yes. Yes. There's a, There's a note, note. Yeah. I think Julian's Julian said to try muting, muting and then unmuting Cam. It's, that appears to be better now. Thank you. I will wind up at that. Thank you very much for listening. But um, yes, the decommissioning levy campaign is a huge opportunity to lock in um, the requirement for these companies to clean up their mess. Us as taxpayers should not be paying for that. And the industry is kind of hardwired on this concept of, you know, it, what, externalizing the costs and internalizing the profits. And this is a fantastic campaign opportunity that might allow us to get a permanent levy right across the sector. So just to recap and to finish, the moratorium's lifted in Victoria. Please have a look for Drill Watch if you're interested. The offshore gas licenses are due in March next year. Um, please pay attention to that. Have, if, if you're not involved in a group, you know, just do a web search. There's the, um, I think it's called the Ocean Alliance, uh, Wilderness Society, Greenpeace, Friends of the Earth, lots of groups are working on the offshore gas issue. Do a bit of research, figure out which issue motivates you the most, um, and then, you know, kind of get involved. Um, Seed Mob is an Indigenous led group which is doing a fantastic job against unconventional gas in the top end. Uh, and keep an eye out for the decommissioning um, levy campaign that's going to be launched very soon. I hope this has been interesting uh, for you all. Thank you very much for having a listen, and I'll finish there. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much, Cam. Um, I'm just going to change this. Uh,
Uh, look, I've had a suggestion come through from Tim Forthy that maybe we should take questions from Cam now because the two speakers do have very different uh, focus. Um, and so I think that's probably a good idea. Are you okay with that, Cam, if we go that way? Absolutely, yes. Yep, okay, fantastic. If, so, if we were going to do that, I forgot, um, we actually have a forum in Hawthorne coming up, which is looking at the uh, Conference of Parties and what Australia needs to do, specifically the federal government. So if you wanted to have a look for Act on Climate Forum in Hawthorne, you'd find it, it would be great if people felt inspired to come along to that one. Fantastic. Okay, so I am going to hand over to Ken, who I hope is here tonight. Um, and Ken, I'm going to ask you to start by taking a question out of the chat. Have we got Ken Parker on? Uh, no, he's not here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Would that's fine. Like <laughs> What's that? Would Annie like to ask them? I can yeah, do how about, that. How, Annie, how about you and I swap off one one on one off? Yeah. Sounds good. There there aren't a lot um, of questions that come in yet. So um, yeah, keep asking questions, everybody. Um, on um, Cam's Cam's um, talk there, um, we do have a couple. Um, Julian is curious, Cam, on your perspective on the big renewables energy projects. Um, so the Asian Renewable Energy Hub, Western Green Energy Hub, et cetera. Um, will these mega industrial projects run into the same sorts of concerns as the current generation of fossil fuel projects? That's a really good question. Um, this is new terrain and we really don't know the parameters around how this industry will uh, develop and it's essential that we get it right. Uh, we haven't been working on that issue so much, but we have been working on offshore wind because people will be aware here in Victoria, we have the chance to see the Star of the South project develop, which would be in its capacity about equivalent to one of the three remaining coal-fired power stations that's operating in the Trove Valley. We think it's a game changer for Victoria. We're very strongly supportive of it, but there are no federal guidelines to assess these sort of things. The federal government has committed to releasing federal offshore wind guidelines. They haven't done so, they've been sitting on it for a year and a half, but the offshore wind issue kind of highlights new issues like green hydrogen for export, like these major industrial parks of renewables that are intended to produce green hydrogen in manufacturing areas where currently we have fossil fuel production. We need to make sure we get that right. So what we need in the very first instance is a very vigorous and a very robust assessment process. We can't afford to just rush ahead with this technology and then, you know, find ourselves in a kind of cane toad style scenario. So we've got this dilemma, we want to move quickly, but at the same time, you know, we've got to, you know, hurry, have haste, but make sure we, we build the bridge that we need to walk across. So we do face this dilemma. And unfortunately, with the current government, when we look at what might happen with the offshore wind program already it would seem that the government wants to empower the entity which currently assesses offshore oil and gas which is very problematic to manage this system so we need to put a lot of time and effort into creating the framework that will guide the development of an export renewable hydrogen uh, industry and the framework that will allow really vigorous and really robust assessment of the offshore industry but we have to get on with both of them as well very very quickly I hope that answered the question. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, the next question is mine, haha. <laughs> so I'm asking the questions, I can choose it. Um, so why do you think there is that inconsistency in the Victorian government's policy on gas and on climate? What were the pressures that made them remove that moratorium in, on onshore gas here? I think that from the start, they were intending to lift it. And I honestly feel that there's a problem with some of the unions here in this state who still believe that gas is necessary for manufacturing. Um, I feel that they are possibly being disproportionately influential in that decision. It's really unfortunate. If you go back to that Australia, um, Australia Institute report that I mentioned, they actually break down employment in the manufacturing sector and what percentage of 
manufacturing actually requires gas as a feedstock. It is mm -hmm. actually quite tiny. From memory, it's 14,000 jobs in the entire uh, country at this point. And BZE have done that really great work about how we can electrify all of manufacturing. But I do feel that there are some of our comrades and friends in the union movement that still believe that gas is necessary, at least as a transition fuel. And I do think that that has therefore influenced the position of the Victorian government. Mm. Thank you. Annie, over to you. Yeah, it's really interesting, Cam. Um, I guess it highlights a little bit uh, even more the, the importance of uh, community building around it, around um, these issues. Um, which brings me to my next question, which is, um, I've got a question here from someone who's interested in how the Lock the Gate campaign was so successful. Um, and I guess the um, moratorium um, campaign would be similar. Um, and what is it that unites people against gas in all its forms? It's, I think initially there's a, there's a, there are some, you know, magic herbs and spices in the campaign, I think. Uh, the first one is love of place. You know, again, climate change, it is often esoteric in our thinking. Um, love of place was at the core of the lock, the gate campaign. It was people mobilising to defend their patch, their community, their watershed. And that's really, really important. It was also non-ideological. So it said, we are here, this is site resistance. We are defending our community and you don't have to be left, right, center you know you don't need to be anything you just need to care about your community so its focus was on finding common ground rather than saying oh you're a denier and you're a you know you understand the science so it was around bringing people together it was always predicated on this concept of looking up so don't look down to your community and your organizing look up to how your community needs to engage with its neighbors how it needs to show solidarity and how it needs to apply political pressure up onto the state level and very importantly what it do, what it did was and there's a fantastic woman called Annie Keir from the Northern Rivers region of New South Wales that did a lot of the methodology work on this she came up with the gas field free organizing model so if Kuyong say for instance decided it was going to declare itself gas field free you'd go out you'd door knock that entire community and you'd find out what they want to do and you collect that data and as as each community does its declarations you collect that data and then you can go to politicians and you can say 94 percent of people in Kuyong uh you know supported us in this initiative and one language that politicians understand is the language of organizing and when they look at that data and they see 94 percent of people here and 86 percent of people here they understand the human power that goes into that door knocking and compiling that data and what it does is indicate to them the political intent and the political currency of those organizations so unity look up build community power and build connection to place and always come from a place of the heart which is this is this is our country and we're here to look after it okay thank you um be interesting to see if Kion could ever declare itself gas free <laughs> we will be talking to people about gas in the streets um it is Next a big question. ask for Kuyong, it's a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this is a controversial one, I think. I wonder if you have info on methane leakage. I have heard it exceeds 15% of any gas discovered by drilling. Fugitive emissions are always underestimated, but I honestly, that's not my specialty, so I won't attempt to speak to it. Okay, no worries. Um, so there was another question I'll go to then. Two of the Victorian government scenarios they are considering in the towards 2050 gas infrastructure in a zero emissions economy consultation paper include carbon capture and storage. What do you think is the viability of those scenarios? Carbon capture and storage has absorbed something like $1.3 billion of taxpayers' money and it's delivered pretty much nothing and it is going nowhere. And anyone that's honest knows that it is going nowhere and the ALP should be honest and accept that it's going nowhere and they need to step away from that delusion. You know, there was a point when we developed, 
we were developing wind technology and there was a point as we were developing solar technology, we didn't really know if it would work. You know, think of how far those technologies have come since the 1970s. Carbon capture and storage hasn't evolved since the 1970s. Look at the Gorgon project, that massive gas project offshore from Northwest WA. It has radically underdelivered on all its commitments regarding the storage, the sequestration of carbon. So it's, a it's just time we park that one. You know, CCS is going nowhere. It's like new generation nukes. It's going nowhere. It's not a solution to anything. Let's just park that and let's go with the stuff that works. Renewables works, storage works, efficiency works. So the time for that conversation is over, I would say. Okay, thank you. Annie? Fairly definitive answer, Cam. Um, I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit more about the um, decommissioning levy. We've got a comment from um, Shane who talks about it being a bit of a moral hazard. Um, you know, if companies feel uh, less pressure to clean up, if they believe there's a fund to do it, how would it um, work, I guess, uh, to actually pressure companies to, um, yeah, pollute less. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, just to be very frank with you, this is a campaign that's absolutely in its infancy and nationally we've had a, an entire hour together talking about how it might work. So we're not suggesting we've got, you know, a, a brilliant campaign strategy as yet, but we do see it as a huge opportunity. And the reality is that if you look at, um, there's the petroleum rent resources tax, which is in, in theory that the, the resource, the royalties tax that the, the offshore oil and gas companies pay for the use of our resources, often companies basically don't pay it. They find ways to write it off. And I was just reading some stuff um, on the Gorgon project, which I think is Shell, Chevron, ExxonMobil, you know, the way they do the books, they're probably never going to pay any of that tax anyway. This is an industry where I believe hardwired into the system is this notion of the, you know, the internalizing of the, the cost, the cost come back to the taxpayer anyway. So I think you're right. There is a kind of moral hazard risk there, but I think we face a moral hazard risk of them pulling up stakes uh, and, you know, going away anyway. Um, so yeah, hopefully that will be something we'll, we'll figure out as we hammer out the strategy. But good point and thank you for raising it. I think we've got time for maybe two more questions. Um, one here from David Strang. Infrastructure Victoria thinks that the gas distribution network could be decommissioned by 2040. Do you think that this is possible? Yes, absolutely. Um, I, it's, it's so interesting. It's almost a schizophrenic system we have at present. The government has lifted the moratorium and yet they've got this gas substitution net, uh, framework, which is getting us off gas. And yet they're talking about the Western Link gas pipeline project. There's so many consultations and so many plans underway at present. They're all kind of at odds. But one thing I take heart from, there was a state government program, I think it was called Energy to the Regions, which was a program of rolling out gas reticulation to regional centres that currently weren't on, on reticulated gas as opposed to bottled gas. The government, I think, probably four years ago stopped funding that. Um, and I think that that was a really good move that indicated an attempt to say, let's not lock public money into the stranded assets of new gas pipelines to regions, given the cost of gas can only go in one direction, which is up. So I take heart from that, but certainly I feel that we could decommission by 2040. In, in fact, I think we'd have a fair bit of spare change on that. We could do that well, well earlier. Okay, thank you. Penny? Uh, one more, I think. Um, I've got a, a question here from um, Malcolm, um, which I guess is more of a, um, uh, a statement, but it is still a question. Um, the question is, how can investment in fossil fuels be reconciled with a duty of care for future generations? Um, which I think is something that <laughs> keeps us all up at night. But if you could speak a bit to that, Cam, that'd be great. Yeah, and it can't. You know, if if we had no viable alternatives and the only way to keep the lights on and, you know, keep economy moving was to invest in fossil fuels, we'd think very hard about it. 
but we're a decade past that point. You know, the technology, the alternative technology has become mainstream and there is no argument in any way, shape or form now to invest in any further fossil fuels. There is the dilemma we face of what happens to people who currently are employed in those sectors and we cannot walk away from them. So there is a, you know, a huge impetus on us it is necessary that we don't just throw people on the trash heap. And the reality is when industries change, often governments let them go. So think about what happened with the loss of the car manufacturing sector here in Victoria. There was some transition money, but a lot of people are still doing it hard and a lot of people never found work. Look at the transition of the forestry sector in places like the wet tropics of North Queensland. Sometimes we do transition well, sometimes we leave people to their own devices. There's no reason to invest in fossil fuels anymore, but we do have moral responsibility, just a basic human rights responsibility to fund a meaningful and a serious just and fair transition program. And that has to be hardwired into our response as we transition onto renewables. Okay, well, look, thank you very much for that. I think we'll have to stop with the questions there. Um, so I just want to say thank you very much, Cam. Um, you have been a leader in this movement for a long time, and that's a great gift to us. And uh, so I thank you for giving us your time this evening. And I hope that many of us will join in some of the campaigns that Cam was talking about. Um, Drill Watch, it would be a good one for us all to get connected to. Um, so I thank you uh, again very much for joining us this evening. Cheers. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Okay, so um, now we're going to move on to the second part of the evening. If I can work how to do the spotlighting, that would be good. Let's see. Okay, here we go. Um, right, our second speaker. Our next speaker is Tim Forsey. This is a, a bit of a change in gears. Uh, Tim is a chemical engineer with over 35 years experience working in the oil, gas and electricity industries in Australia and abroad. Between 2013 and 2017, Tim acted as an energy advisor at the University of Melbourne. Over the last decade, Tim has been in over 1000 Melbourne homes acting as a home energy advisor. That is a huge number. He created the Facebook group, My Efficient Electric Home, where over 14,000 members help each other to save money in their ever more comfortable and greener electric homes. So Tim is going to be talking to us about making that transition off gas at home. Will you please welcome Tim Forsey? Well, hi everybody. And uh, thanks for that introduction. And thanks for organizing this uh, get together here tonight. We've got quite a number of participants, it's huge, so it's fantastic. But I almost think we should just go on listening to, uh, to Cam because he's got so much knowledge and enthusiasm there and he's, he's really got the idea on the big picture. I, I think these days I'm looking more at the, the small picture, um, sometimes crawling into people's roof spaces under their houses, that's definitely the small picture. But um, uh, it is on the program tonight that I'm supposed to present, so I guess I'll get stuck into it. So let me try and share the screen here and uh, find something of interest and uh, start with this. So I do have some slides and uh, that's the cover slide there. So we'll be talking about the efficient electric home and you see me there standing next to a couple of heat pumps. So I probably spend most time talking about heat pumps because people really don't understand what they are and how they get free renewable heat from outside your house, which you can then use to heat your water or heat your living spaces. Uh, for heating living spaces, that's also known as the reverse cycle air conditioner, but people don't understand how they work so much. So we'll spend a bit of time talking about them tonight. Um, whereas when it comes to insulation draft proofing, I guess people, have an understanding of those things, but uh, they're also incredibly important. So I don't know in the group tonight here how many people have are already in an all electric home or they're working toward getting toward an all electric home or they've been thinking about it but haven't done anything or maybe they hadn't even thought, of, thought about it before. 
So there's certainly a wide range of, of people out there. And, but it is a time for all of us, I suppose, to start thinking about making our homes as efficient as we can and also to uh, not be burning any gas in those homes. So that's what the presentation is about tonight. Um, I advanced this slide up in my slide pack because there was one of those questions tonight. Someone was saying, can we decommission the, uh, the gas infrastructure? Well, here you see people decommissioning the gas infrastructure in their own backyards. So once you've got to the situation where you're using your reverse cycle air conditioners for heating, you're using heat pumps for hot water, you've switched over the gas cooktop to an electric or induction cooktop, then you don't really uh, need to be paying a gas bill anymore. So you stop paying the gas bill, and then just to make sure you ring up and have the gas meter taken away, because uh, you may well want to get some sort of a shrubbery happening there where the gas meter used to be, so you might as well get rid of the gas meter. And this is what people are doing uh, around Victoria, around the country, and we know this because of the Facebook group, My Efficient Electric Home. Lynn, in that introduction, mentioned 14,000 members. Well, that that introduction must be a couple months old because we've got 32,000 members in the group now, or well, actually probably 33,000 by tomorrow. So it really has been taking off and there's a lot of information there for people, but I'll come back to that. Just a bit more of an introduction about myself and the, the career path. I started in America on a dairy farm. My folks had a dairy farm, but I left the farm and became a chemical engineer and started working in chemical plants and refineries and oil rigs. So all around the world brought me to Australia. That was fun for a while, but I suppose it was about 1990. We started thinking about climate change and uh, there had to be other options rather than just burning all the fossil fuels we could possibly find. So I eventually did leave the industry. I was fortunate to get a gig doing some research at the University of Melbourne on a number of topics. But one of those we'll talk about tonight is the home economics of using reverse cycle air conditioners to heat your house. And these days in semi-retirement, I do go into people's homes and I'll spend three hours with, with people in their homes talking about all the things they could be doing to improve the home how to get the most out of the reverse cycle air conditioners, how to get the most out of the solar panels, uh, is the insulation up to scratch, do they need to do some draft roofing, all of those things. So that's quite a lot of fun. Um, I had, a clients, had clients today in, um, where was it, Hawthorne and just around the corner in Moorabbin and uh, really great fun to work with people who are interested in making some improvements in their homes. But um, this was the University of Melbourne research that we published back uh, probably in about 2015 it was. And we, we finally sat down and looked at the economics of heating a house with the reverse cycle air conditioners, which are getting more efficient all the time in collecting free renewable heat from outside your house and bringing it in so it keeps your house warm. And, uh, and meanwhile, gas just keeps getting more expensive. So back in 2015, when we did the numbers, we found that people could save hundreds and hundreds of dollars in their homes if they would simply find the heat button on the reverse cycle air conditioner that they probably already owned. Every summer, more and more Australian homes are getting the reverse cycle air conditioners, and uh, but people only use them in the summer for cooling, and they and then they hide the remote control and they don't think about it through winter. But if people can find the remote control, check the batteries, find the heat button, push the button they can start heating their home at a fraction of the cost of, of burning gas. But around the same time we were publishing that research, I was also doing it in my, in my own home. And what we found in our weatherboard house here in Bayside, Melbourne, is that uh, instead of using gas, we could use reverse cycle air conditioners at either end of the house, and we could comfortably heat the house at about the third the cost of using the gas. So it was Did I blow that whole thing? Yeah, we lost your sound. Sorry, that was me, Tim. You can share your screen again and keep going. From the beginning? No, no, no. No, we heard till about 20 seconds ago, 30 seconds. Okay, all right. Wow, you threw me there. Uh, I've done this a few times. Uh, okay, so this slide, perhaps? <laughs> Hope so. 
Uh, so what I was saying here was that in our weatherboard house, we can heat our house for a third the cost of using gas. The technologies are here, the economics are here, so we just need to get on with it. Um, and when you add up all the numbers, so basically in Victoria, we're spending about two to three billion dollars a year on gas for buildings, and basically all of that is being wasted because there's cheaper options now. So um, some of those, you know, we can start saving that money straight away if you've already got a reverse psycho air conditioner and if you never tried it for heating, well, you don't have to buy anything. You don't have to pay any extra money. You just have to push the heat button. So that's some low hanging fruit and some good savings there already. Um, but for others, of course, there will be transition needed. Um, people need to have the information as to what can be done, how to do it. And um, so, uh, yeah, gas heaters need to be replaced with reverse cycle air conditioners. Gas hot water heaters need to be replaced with heat pumps. Cook, cooktops need to be replaced. So there will be this transition, but the the key message is that the the economics are already there, and now it's just a matter of time of how quickly we can get this all happening. And as was mentioned, but the Victorian government having con some consultations on this, that, and the other thing. That's my key message for them is electrification already makes sense. We don't need to wait for anything. We don't need to work out how to keep the gas industry viable. Uh, the point is that it's not viable and people should be getting on with saving quite a bit of money by getting their homes off gas. Um, this is one example that we had one of the first case studies from Richard Keach who put together the book, Energy Freedom Home for Beyond Zero Emissions. And so Richard's weatherboard house in Essendon was one of the first case studies. We can see here in 2006, Richard's house was burning this much gas, uh, the red shown in energy units and using this much electricity, the blue shown in energy units. And um, Richard didn't do it overnight, but over a period of time, he was able to get his house completely off of gas. And the interesting thing is you don't even see his electricity use increasing that much. So through here, he might have, uh, you know, replaced the halogen light bulbs with LEDs or got a better television or a better refrigerator. But meanwhile, he was using the reverse cycle air conditioners for heating all winter, and he was able to totally eliminate the gas without seeing the electricity increase that much. And these charts don't even take into account that uh, Richard ended up with three solar PV systems on his roof, which meant really all this blue disappears as well. Um, in that his house is, is net energy zero, um, not really requiring any net energy through the course of a year. So that was a case study that was available from Richard. That was great. Um, yeah, this shows the situation where if you're lucky enough to, to have solar panels on your roof and the sun happens to come out in winter, well, it, during those times, you've got some very cheap electricity that you can use to drive the heat pump, the air conditioner to get the free renewable heat from outside and come in and heat your home. So that's a very, very uh, cheap heating indeed, at least when the sun's shining. Um, but we, we didn't have, you know, enough case studies. If we had Richard's house, my house, maybe a few others, um, we didn't have a lot of case studies as to what was possible. And also we wanted to get the message out to the world. So my kids said, you know, dad, there's this thing called social media and Facebook. So maybe you could give that a try. So I looked up what was this Facebook thing about six years ago and started this Facebook group, My Efficient Electric Home. And like I said, now we're up close to 33,000 members. We're getting uh, three, at least 300 members a week, sometimes more people coming in from all around the country and sometimes even from around the world. And it's people helping each other to uh, improve their homes, get off gas, make their homes more comfortable and reduce their environmental footprint. So if you're not in there already, uh, new members welcome. And so now we have thousands of case studies and here's a few testimonials here. I'll read this one. We used our reverse psycho air conditioner this winter in Canberra, worked great on track to save $1,100. That's from Jackie. So we're starting to see the very, you know, very similar numbers to what we'd calculated in, at Melbourne Uni a few years ago as to the savings that are possible by getting off gas. And then um, other organizations since then have started to sing the same song. Renew uh, published a very important study in 2018 where they worked out how homes could save tens of thousands of dollars if, you know, they were fortunate enough to be able to 
get the solar panels happening and to get the house off of gas. And so now we even see Choice Magazine talking about the all electric home. And if you dig far enough, you'll find on the Victorian government website, a section where they talk about the all electric home. So that was quite, a, quite amazing that just in a few short years, we're seeing a lot of organizations starting to talk about the all electric home. And here's a quite surprising one, AGL. So now AGL, if you dig hard enough through their websites, you'll find a few where they're saying that you should get your home off gas. So this is the company formerly known as the Australian Gaslight Company is saying you shouldn't have any gas in your house. Uh, AGL rang me up one day, did an interview, wrote down everything I said and put it on their website. So we were pretty happy to see AGL um, come to that point of view. And, um, but uh, why wouldn't they? Because this chart here shows you what happened the other day on the wholesale gas market around the country. This shows Brisbane, Adelaide, Sydney, but it was the same in Melbourne. If normally a wholesale gas price is about $7 a gigajoule, well, overnight it shot up past 30. Um, so this is the sort of thing that's going on in the gas market these days that people are always focused on electricity prices, electricity prices <laughs> without really noticing that the price of gas is going through the roof. Now, these wholesale prices don't immediately flow on to the household, but they will eventually, and the price of gas is just going to keep going up. So get your house off gas. Um, but it's not just about the heat pumps, the air conditioners, the fuel choice that you're making. It's also about the thermal envelope of the house. So make sure your insulation is in good shape. Too often I poke my head up in roof spaces and we see that the NBN person has been up in the roof space or someone went to fix a roof leak or to replace a light bulb. And in doing so, they shifted the, uh, the insulation and then they didn't think it was their job to put it back. So I've been in lots of homes where the client says, yeah, yeah, we got, we got lots of insulation up there. And they certainly do, but it's all in one big pile in the corner. So um, it's worth having a look up in your roof space or if safe to do so, or have someone, uh, some professional have a look and see if your roof space insulation could use some help. And um, also the other bits of the house. So walls can be retrofitted with insulation these days, underfloor insulation. I had some clients the other day, a younger couple, and they had quotes for topping up their roof space insulation, getting insulation blown into the walls and insulation put under the, under the floors. And it was probably going to be ten or $11,000, but they were going to do it because they realized they wanted to be comfortable. And if they had bought a new home, even built to the legal minimum standard, the new home you'd buy would have insulation in the roof space, in the walls, under the floor. So why shouldn't other people in other homes also be comfortable? And so there's some more money, sure. They were gonna put it in their mortgage and they'd see some energy savings as the time went by and they'd also be more comfortable. So these things can be retrofitted. Um, and also have a look at the draft proofing. Too many homes just have way too many gaps. Last night was windy in Melbourne. That was a, a bit of a draft proofing test going on that night. If you felt breezes blowing around your house, well, that's not good enough. Uh, these things can be fixed and should be fixed. That's what you'd find in a modern well-built house, you wouldn't have breezes blowing around the house on a windy night. So these things can be fixed. Um, get some advice as to how to go about that. And, uh, but also while you're doing that, making your house tighter, well, first of all, if you are gonna tighten up your house, you really don't wanna be burning gas anymore in the house, or you should certainly have your gas heating checked to make sure it's not poisoning you with carbon monoxide. So that's a concern. And also you need to manage the moisture. So um, as we tighten up our houses, we need to be careful that we're, we're not trying to dry laundry in the lounge room anymore because that'll just add liters of moisture to your living space that now um, isn't just gonna leak out with the first wind. So it's a different way of thinking. It's a different way of managing homes. Uh, windows is the other part. The windows are always the weak spot in the thermal envelope. So making sure you've got good drapes and blinds and that they're closed right now. It's nighttime. You don't need to see through the windows anymore. So you might as well try and keep some heat in. And then there's the other options for improving the glazing, whether it's secondary glazing, retrofit double glazing, uh, window films. There's, there's lots of different techniques that can be applied to improve the windows, which are always the weak spot. Uh, monitor your electricity use. Fortunately, in Victoria, we do have the widespread rollout of the smart meters. 
And so there should be no surprises anymore. Um, you know, three months shouldn't go by and you get a big electricity bill and it surprises you. Rather, these days you can be uh, monitoring your electricity use a lot more closely, at least for a while, till you really understand how your home operates and whether or not you're going to have any surprises when it comes to the electricity bill. Hopefully you can get things under control and be comfortable. Uh, but uh, one last thing, with uh, any of this equipment that blows air around, there's, there's going to be filters or there should be. And this is some of the lowest hanging fruit. Check those filters. If you haven't done it for a while, you'll probably find they're filthy. And so how is either your ducted heating system or your split system uh, reverse cycle air conditioner meant to function if the filters are in this condition? And I see this far too often. What else? Uh, that's, a, that's a key final message. Uh, this winter, heat with your air con. Get going and start reducing your gas use. So I was going to finish there, but as uh, Cam was speaking, I thought of a few extra slides. Um, down at Bass Strait, you know, where I used to work, where gas used to be a cheap byproduct of oil, well, it's finishing up. And, uh, you know, no one ever said gas uh, that Bass Strait was going to last more than 55 years or so. So in the very short future, if you're still using gas in Victoria, more and more of it is going to be Queensland coal seam gas, which has come down to Victoria across thousands of kilometers across these pipelines. So if you thought your gas was good old local Victorian gas, that's finishing up and the gas you'll be burning now will be this Queensland coal seam gas, which of course has its impacts. I mean, this is, this is what goes on in Queensland now. They are pin cushioning the countryside so they can get all these coal seam wells in there. Um, in this scene, that's about 150 wells here. But if they're going to drill 40,000, you have to mentally multiply this image about 300 times. And you can see what they're doing to the landscape in Queensland. If you're uh, still on gas in Victoria, this is what you're contributing to. And there was a question asked about the fugitive emissions. I've been up in the Queensland coal seam gas fields with an infrared camera and we see where the methane is just being continuously released from that infrastructure up there. They could have spent the money so that there were not these methane releases, but it was cheaper for them to uh, not do a 100% job. The question was how much are the releases? No one really knows because Probably not even the gas industry is bothering to keep track. They've built what they've built and they're happy with it. And they also have a system where they're able to just supply numbers to the government that um, actually come out of the uh, American conventional oil and gas industry from decades ago. And everybody's happy to use those fairly low figures. But if just uh, about 3% of this methane is released, because methane's a powerful greenhouse gas, well, then gas is even worse than coal if you were using it for generating electricity. But uh, we don't want to use coal anymore either. So the better comparison is, is gas dirtier than renewable energy? It certainly is. And, uh, you know, wait, it gets worse. I mean, not only is there gas being emitted from the facilities, but also gas just bubbling up from the ground now that they've sucked the water out of the water table. Um, quite a bit of the gas is going into their wells, but some of the gas is also just being released into the environment like this. So that's the powerful greenhouse gas methane. That's the end now, really. And I'll stop sharing the screen and happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you very much, Tim. Lots and lots for us to think about in our homes. But I'm glad I wasn't on mute the whole first half. No, 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 no. That only happened for a very short time. So that was that was all good. Uh, yeah, so we've got a good um, almost 15 minutes for questions here. Um, so I don't know um, if this Ken returned. Are we going to have Ken doing questions or no? No, I don't think so. Okay, um, so we'll take questions from the chat. I'm going to start off with one because it's my question. Um, and that is, what are your thoughts on ducted um, reverse cycle heating as opposed to individual units? And can you use the ducts that were for your gas um, heating? Yeah, um, 
not too long ago, I put together an hour long webinar that addresses those questions. So that's on the Renew YouTube channel. So there was about an hour present and probably an hour's worth of questions that came afterwards. Uh, really good questions that of course we get all the time. Um, and uh, you know, this is depends, are we talking about a new home? Or are we talking about a, a retrofit where you've got different options? Um, the, the one question on reusing ducts, uh, if you've got ducted gas heating through the floor and you're just thinking, well, maybe I could convert that over to reverse cycle air conditioning, probably uh, the ducts will have to be replaced. And you may want to anyway, because they may be a bit old and dirty and an in unknown uh, installation quality anyhow. But um, the gas heating, there's no doubt that gas heating can put out a powerful heat. I mean, gas burns hot enough to melt glass. So um, I'm not sure why we're using it in homes, but it's certainly powerful. But that means the heat that comes out of a gas system is hotter. And so the ducts that they've generally run historically for ducted gas heating are smaller than the ones you're going to need when you're going to use it for reverse cycle heating. And also you'll want to use it for the air conditioning cooling in the summertime. So generally you need bigger ducts. So um, you can talk to uh, suppliers of these systems as to whether they'd be willing to give it a go to reuse some of the existing stuff you have in your house. But um, often we find that uh, for them to offer any sorts of guarantees, they're going to want to replace it. Okay. But um, individual split systems versus ducted systems. I mean, in our house, you know, we've got an old weatherboard here in Bayside, Melbourne. We just have split systems at either end. That's the most efficient way to go. Um, but some other people will want to opt for the ducted. Too often we run the ducts like right up through the roof space or under the floor. I mean, the ducts are insulated, but they're not insulated that well. So there's inefficiencies there. And also one thing that people forget with the ducted systems is if you're heating a bedroom, well, that you got to leave the bedroom door open because that air has to get back to the return because the ducted system, it's all, you know, heating your whole house at the same time. So if that's the way you want to operate your house, that's fine. But you actually find in reality, people would rather wish they didn't have a ducted system, you know, where they had to leave all the bedroom doors open and that sort of thing. So there's a number of different considerations that I go through in that, uh, those webinars on the uh, Renew YouTube channel, just search for my name and heat pumps. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Over to you, Annie. Thanks. Yeah, we'll see if we can find some of those, um, yeah, those links and, and share them with everybody as well. Um, I agree has a question, which is a little bit close to uh, <laughs> my heart, which is what can we do as tenants to um, help transition our homes to being more electric and more efficient? Yes, well, um, education is part of it. So I do go into all sorts of properties and sometimes there'll be three heating systems in a property. And uh, so number one, they're using the gas, but because they thought that was cheaper, but then if they're not using that, then they might be using the resistive electric panel heaters. But all the while up on the wall has been a brand new efficient air conditioner sitting there, <laughs> but it, they thought they shouldn't use it because we've demonized the use of air conditioners. You know, all summer long you say, oh, don't turn on the air conditioner. It's expensive and it'll crash the electricity grid. So in a way we've demonized them and that carries over into winter time that people think, oh, well, obviously that must be the worst way to heat your house when it's actually the best. So education is an issue. Um, I think that haven't the tenancy laws changed now that landlords have to provide a source of heating. And I hope in a lot of cases, it's going to be a reverse cycle air conditioner because then you have, you know, the summer cooling, which will also help you to survive our summers that are going to be getting hotter and hotter. But the other thing for landlords or for governments with public housing, the gas heaters are a risk. Um, they do catch fire and they do pr produce at times uh, poisonous carbon monoxide gas, which can get into the living space and kill people. So I know that the Victorian government in recent years has worked out that it's a lot uh, less risky for them to be providing reverse cycle air conditioners for heating rather than risky gas heaters. So that's one way that um, uh, some properties will have uh, multiple heating systems and they need to pick the right one. But uh, 
you know, if there's not a reverse cycle air conditioner in a rental property, perhaps, you know, you, uh, a renter can lobby the landlord to, to get that because it will find good use both in winter and summer. All right, I'll have some conversations with my landlord, Tim. <laughs> um, Ken, are you, um, Ian, or do you want Lynn to ask one more question, then we'll come to you? Uh, yeah, Lynn can ask one more, that's fine. Okay, um, so um, the question, curious if you have a typical type for your clients. Is the demographic, demographic of people looking for electric solutions changing? Richard Keach um, has been in just as many homes as I have. And Richard says, and I'd probably agree with this, that 95% um, of the people that ring up for help, they ring up because they're uncomfortable. And you see business for home energy consultants really takes off when it's cold and when it's hot. And you can go some of the nicer months of the year uh, and not get a phone call because everybody's comfortable and they're not really thinking of it. So 95% of the people ring up because of comfort issues, 3% because the energy bills are high and 2% are interested in, in the green side. So that, that's kind of the demographic, uh, splitting the demographics a different way. I'm finding um, a lot of clients who, you know, perhaps are the older set. And uh, so they definitely want to be comfortable. They want to kind of future proof their homes and get it sorted up, sorted out where they are in their stage of life so they can just ride it through and not have to worry about things so much. And also, since no one's going to Europe, et cetera, um, there's more time to sit at home and think about how uncomfortable you are. And another part of the demographic is, is probably the younger set where maybe they just bought a house or they've got a young family and they didn't used to worry about the house so much because they would all head off to work and school and not have to think about it but with people trapped at home through some of these winter and summer seasons, again, they're realizing how uncomfortable their homes are. And again, um, you know, certainly no one's going on very expensive holidays. So some of that money is coming into fixing up the houses. Okay, surprising. I would have thought more people thinking about climate, but you're putting that out at about 2%. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's not the, the thing that actually gets people to pick up the phone. Interesting. Um, there, was, there was certainly a situation, we saw this on the Facebook group and elsewhere, with the big bushfires and people were being smoked out in their houses. There, there was a big interest there in making the houses tighter than they had been before so that you could keep the smoke out. And that carries into winter a bit. If your neighbor is burning wood. And of course, we're hearing more and more about the health impacts of burning, the, uh, breathing the wood smoke. So you might wanna tighten up your house also to keep your neighbor's smoke out of your house. Um, and then the other thing we found with those bushfires is in Melbourne, there'd been a lot of use of the evaporative type of uh, cooling systems, but those uh, require that you draw air through the house once through. And again, they couldn't be used during the bushfires with all the smoke. So in that case, a lot more people were heading over to the refrigerative air conditioning, which then is a reverse cycle air conditioner. So you can use it for heating. So one thing about evaporative cooling, you can't use it to heat your house. Okay, who's next, Danny? Um, I think, Ken, did you have a question? Yeah, um, I've, got a, I've got a question, thanks, yeah. Yeah, I was just thinking, uh, Tim, that when we give the Energy Freedom Home presentations to for BZE, that uh, <clears throat> you, do do, you do need to mix in your incentives. You can't rely on people just coming forward just to, to uh, clean up the earth. So having some financial and other incentives, I think, is uh, really helpful. Um, well, because as I said, comfort, comfort, comfort. In fact, I've changed my business card. I'm no longer an energy advisor. I'm a home comfort and energy advisor. <laughs> and my wife thought that was a bit weird, but that's what it is. I think you're recognizing the reality there, Tim. Well done. Mm. Um, my question is, uh, on behalf of Philip, is, is there an efficient way to run hydronic heating radiators from heat pumps instead of gas? And I'm going to pass this on to my son because in spite of all our pressure, he's gone for these hydronic heaters uh, powered by gas. And if, if you can help us dissuade him, that'd be great. <laughs> uh, 
Um, sorry, is it too late to change? <laughs> uh, maybe for him, but uh, I think the question gets to the core of it. Um, people seem to like hydronic heaters. Uh, so well, yeah, there's, yeah. yeah, there's no doubt that that, <clears throat> that that radiant feel of the heat coming from the hydronic heaters is, is lovely. <clears throat> and particularly if, you know, most of the Melbourne houses are really poor. And so at least you can go sit right on top of the uh, hydronic heater and you'll be warm. But that's really not the mindset that we ought to make, you know, major decisions on. I mean, to get a hydronic heater, you're talking even gas fired fifteen, twenty thousand dollars, and even more thirty thousand dollars if it's powered by a uh, a, a heat pump. Mm. So it's a big investment, and um, actually, if you can improve the other parts of your house, the thermal envelope, or if you're you're buying a new place, uh, we do have that star rating system. And if you look at the numbers, a uh, six star is the legal minimum, but uh, even even a six star home doesn't use that much energy. Seven star homes even a lot better. If you've got a house of that quality, you really don't need hydronic heating, and and also you can't cool your house with hydronic heating in the summer. <laughs> so if you've got a decent house, and there've been there've been a number of people, um, in fact, a, a famous one, Cameron Munro, he published an article in Renew Magazine and had his house up for Sustainable House Day. Uh, I think he lives not too far from your area. Um, Cameron built a really nice addition to his house, very good thermal envelope, spent $40,000 on the heat pump hydronic underfloor heating, but he also put an air conditioner in there. And turns out all he has to do is just turn on the air conditioner and have it ticking over and that does all his heating and cooling needs. And so he's not happy to admit, but he's happy to document that he spent $40,000 he didn't have to. So um, some people just run to hydronic heating because they've experienced it. They know they can sit on top of the radiator and be warm. But really what we ought to be shooting for is houses that have a good thermal envelope. And so if you just have an air conditioner quietly ticking over in the background, putting in a smaller heat, small amount of heat, that should be ideally all that you would need. Again, I'll quote Richard Keach. He says, one of the reasons that Melburnians accept poor performing houses is because they've never spent time in a good one during challenging conditions, be that a really hot day or a really cold day. So he suggests we find some Airbnbs that perform really well and get people into them during the, the worst weather conditions. And they'll say, wow, I didn't even know it was hot outside or I didn't even know it was cold outside didn't need hydronic heating. Maybe I could do that in my own house. Okay. Look, um, we've reached the end of our time for these questions. Um, I think there are a lot more questions that people would like to ask. And it sounds like getting onto the Facebook group would be a good place to start to find lots of answers. So I want to thank you very much, Tim, for coming along. We, we've heard the sort of... Um, large fight that the climate movement is facing with this trend, this shift to gas <clears throat> that the Morrison government is supporting. Um, there's a lot that we can do there, but as Tim is pointing out, there's an awful lot that we can also do in our own homes to reduce the demand so we don't bring that fracked grass, gas down from Queensland uh, into Kuyong. So thank you very much, Tim, <coughs> much appreciated. Um, we're now going to, um, I'm going to hand over to Mick Nolan, the other co-convener of Lighter Footprints, and we're going to do a little bit of Lighter Footprints business. I hope you guys will hang around because um, this is the part of the evening where we talk about the um, advocacy work that we do. Thanks very much. Right. Look, yeah, thank you, uh, Tim and Cam. Uh, so much, so much rich uh, experience there from both of you. <clears throat> really really good I, I just noted from cam decommissioning the gas network by 2040 or earlier that would be fantastic and maybe uh we can we can do it in kuyong by 2030 wouldn't that be uh wouldn't that be something to to shout about um and the other thing i was just reflecting as you were talking tim is the, th the difference between sort of becoming energy efficient and efficient with electricity um, I'm sort of on the journey. I put a heat pump in three weeks ago here, or we put one in at our place. So gas is the thing, that photo where you chop the pipe and you're off gas. That's like, that's a binary thing. I'm off gas completely compared to I've reduced my electricity. So it's 
a kind of a nice obsession <clears throat> that I can feel myself uh, heading along. So uh, that's great. Uh, what we're going to do now is, oh, sorry, the only other thing I was going to say is, and, and this is sort of something that I've discussed with some folks is, um, you know, I think if you make your house energy efficient and we put in heat pumps and we make it comfortable and we might spend some money, but when we come to sell our house, whenever that is in five years or 10 years or 15 years, and somebody walks in a prospective buyer, they're going to go fantastic. So they're going to mentally add the 20,000 or the 15,000 or the 25,000, whatever it is and what they pay. So it's almost like, you know, if you live in the, if you live in the house that's not comfortable and then in 10 years you sell it, you've actually done yourself out of having the enjoyment out of getting that investment in now and then realizing it when you sell it. So that's kind of another way that I can recommend to people start to ponder as well. Um, okay, we're going to move along. Uh, what Ray Peck looks uh, um, is a cheerleader for our letter writing group here in Light of Footprints. So, Ray, are you are you there? I can't see you on my little screen. Are you ready to go? Yes, um, I am, Mick. Um, my microphone's on. My camera's on. I'm ready okay. to share. I'll have, hand over to you, Ray. Okay. Um, I just need to share my screen. Can you see that, Mick? Yes, we can see that. Yep, got it. You're on. You're not on um, the slideshow. You're just on the. You. Know, you yep, perfect. Yeah. So, uh, hi everyone. Um, my name is Ray Peck. I convene the wonderful Lighter Footprint, Footprints Letter Writing Group. We've got about forty-five members, and this is our July report. Uh, July's not over yet. We've still got three days left, which is great. We're going well. Uh, it's another good month. You, we started off January as a record, then February was a new record, and then March was a new record, and then April was yet another. We had four record months in a row. Uh, we had a bit of a rest in May, and now we're slowly working our way up. Uh, you can see that we've got 98 letters published so far in July, and there's still three days left, so we might just set a new record. Let's see. How we go. Uh, so, so far this year, we've published 482 climate letters and uh, 657 letters altogether, including, you know, some other topics that people get a bit fired up about. Uh, which newspapers do we write to? Well, most of our letters uh, end up in The Age because we're based in Melbourne. Um, we've had good success in the Murdoch Press this year, 55 climate letters and 74 altogether in the Herald Sun. The AFR, same financial review, is always very supportive of, of our letters. Um, and we're having good success in the other key Murdoch paper, The, the Australian, uh, this year. That's very encouraging because we know uh, the way that those readers think. And so if they read one of our letters, maybe it might make them rethink. Um, we also write around the country to um, regional and interstate papers. These are our top six um, papers. The Northern Daily Leader is particularly pleasing because it's in Barnaby Joyce territory. That's where he has his home office in Tamworth and he's given us a lot of ammo as you, uh, as you can guess uh, recently. Uh, the Canberra Times is incredibly supportive. It's great to get published in the national capital um, and the other papers are there for you to see. Uh, some July highlights. Uh, four people, five people hit uh, personal milestones uh, that ended in zero. Congratulations in particular to Barb Fraser, who's halfway to 100. Uh, she may get there the way she's going. Leslie and Malcolm are having a good battle, both hitting 40 in July. Ross Hudson not far behind on 30 and closely followed by Rob Bannon and John Mossy coming up on 20. July achievers. Uh, look, Barb Fraser's written nine in July. Fantastic. And Amy, uh, a new member on seven, John Mossig, Malcolm Cameron, Ross Hudson all on seven, Leslie Walker on five. Fantastic contributions in the month of July. Look, um, we really like getting lead letters. It's the first letter in the newspaper the editor picks out uh, and often it gets a big uh, heading and uh, a photograph. Uh, so we've had three this month, Bill Chandler, 
John Gare in the Australian Financial Review and myself in the Canberra Times. Uh, this is Bill's letter in the Australian Financial Review. Lovely photograph of uh, our Prime Minister and Deputy Prime Minister. Oh dear. Um, Bill's uh, quite a great uh, writer um, and this is the how he finished up. Um, now our country's abundant renewable resources will be at the driver will be the driver of our job opportunities and prosperity in the 21st century if we can stop looking in the misty rearview mirror at fossil fuels. So a nice driving analogy there from Bill. Uh, this one is John Gare's letter again with a lovely photo of Barnaby um, and uh, a John uh, highlight I've picked out, if Australia opts to freeload on the rest of the world by continuing to emit more than our fair share of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, that is one thing, but the trade situation is different. But John was writing about uh, carbon border tariffs. Uh, my letter in the Canberra Times, um, I made the point that unless uh, Morrison can rein in Joyce and other deniers in the National Party before the climate uh, conference in November, come up with a real emissions target and action plan, his government will go down as the most unethical and negligent in Australia's history. It's a pretty powerful finishing line. I didn't think it would get published, but the Canberra Times are not afraid to publish some pretty strong political letters we've found over recent months. One of our great highlights was uh, Carmel McNaught's journal article in the Australian Rationalist uh, journal. How lovely would it be to get published in a, a, a journal with that name on scientific literacy and climate change. I look, I really commend this uh, article to you. It's a great read and uh, we can we can set, send it to you if you contact us. Uh, Carmel wrote, uh, sounding the alarm I just can't read this. Oh, here we go, I'll get rid of that window. Sounding the alarm in a doom and gloom fashion doesn't work. However, understanding the science behind climate change could not only reduce the nihilism, but also inspire faith in available solutions. Fake news lies are more readily accepted when the basic science is not understood. So uh, Carmel is arguing for uh, scientific literacy in the community as a priority. Uh, we had Jolly J July for fun. Uh, using humour is a, a good thing in writing letters, uh, if, it, if you can get the humour right, it's a bit of a fine art. Uh, thank you to Malcolm, Amy, Barb and myself for having a go. Um, here's a little snippet for you. This one appeared in the Canberra Times at just the tail end. Perhaps Joyce and Canavan should start their own party. Given their opposition to net zero, the nets would be out. The people's vote would be one of the knots, the nits, or the nuts. Thank you very much. Please join us uh, on our website. Uh, take action is the page. Fill in your details, and I'll get I'll contact you and have a chat. And um, if you want to uh, learn how to write a letter, we've got a blog on our website. Uh, thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you, Ray. Uh, fantastic. Well done to all the letter writers. Uh, it really is unbelievable. And I think, you know, talk about cracking the code. I think um, a lot of Footprints crew on all those different papers around the country have cracked the code on what works almost to the newspaper. Fantastic. Um, I'm just going to run through the community board now in the last few minutes. So I'm going to rattle through fairly quickly. If you look on your agenda that was on the reminder email, you'll see all of these except for one. And you'll also be able to click on the link, which will take you to the Lighter Footprints website um, to the relevant thing. But I'm just going to do the quick community board. And hopefully everyone's really fired up from what, you've heard tonight from Tim and Cam and what you're seeing is going on in light of footprints. COVID's over, you know, we're wanting to get out there, we're wanting to get fired up, we're wanting to uh, get on and, and get people moving off gas, get the government doing the right thing, particularly the state government, they're doing a lot of good work, you know, let's get behind what, what else needs to happen. Uh, Saturday morning street stalls, we have had to delay a couple of times because of the uh, COVID restrictions, but that will be 
an opportunity to get out on the streets in Kew, in Camberwell, in, in another suburb. And if you want to go to talking to our community on the Lighter Footprints website, you can get in touch with Lynn, I think, and register for that. That would be fantastic. We need people on the street conversations. The second is the uh, Burundara Council um, have got a draft climate action plan. Uh, it's available for comment up till the 4th of August. You can go on our website or go via that agenda and find the click point to go and put in a personal submission to the climate action plan. It is looking, you know, okay, but it's not looking great yet. There's also an opportunity to go and complete a survey and make, you know, it's going to take you seven or eight minutes. I did it today. It's pretty straightforward. There's 10 or 12 questions and have your say and put yourself in the game and, and let's keep the pressure on our Burundara Council. Uh, advert for the next event, a lot of footprints coming up at the end of, uh, sorry, the 25th of August, protecting our forest, protecting Victoria's forests. Uh, in fact, two great speakers. We have uh, Sarah Rees and Chris, Dr. Chris Taylor from Sydney and Canberra. They've got a book launching on the Great Forest National Park that is a really important topic, massive biodiversity and carbon locked up in our forests. And we're sort of at a pointy part of Victoria's history. So that will be great to turn up and come along to that. Uh, and finally, and, and Cam did talk about it, I'm going to uh, just hold this up. I have, hope everyone can see this. So the, uh, the folks at, um, Friends of the Earth have got a night coming up on the Lido, at the Lido, sorry, on the 12th of August. If you want to come and again, I spoke about a lot of footprints doing campaigning on the streets. We're going to be supporting Friends of the Earth doing a uh, campaign about Australia's targets. So the Light of Footprints is about more about the gas and the whole thing we've been talking about tonight. Friends of the Earth is going to be about the targets. But we're working, we're working very much in an alliance with both uh, ourselves and uh, Friends of the Earth on increasing Australia's targets and putting pressure on before the, um, the UN Climate Conference in, at Glasgow in November. So that's on the, that's on the uh, August the 12th at 6.30. Um, and go to, the, uh, go to the Friends of the Earth website to find, to find that. Um, Okay, look, thank you to everyone. Fantastic, good turnout tonight. Uh, for those that have stuck around, thank you very much. We'll see you uh, out on the streets or we'll, we'll see you at the next event. Thanks everyone and stay safe.